but I usually start these things by picking something maybe out of the news to talk about. Since none of you mentioned a burning issue, uh, getting up this early in the morning, I presume you'll get to that uh, before the time is up. But um, the, the thing that caught my attention yesterday really was um, the fact that the, the, the Pope made this comment uh, at a presentation seeking forgiveness uh, from the victims of the church. Um, I actually had an extraordinary experience in the, in the apology business. Uh, I've written a lot about it. There's actually an item in your handout called the perfect apology. Um, you don't have to read it now, but uh, it, it, it's a very helpful document. Um, I actually, I wrote, a, I wrote, a, I don't know if it's going to run yet, I wrote an op-ed for the trip on this issue called Where's the Apology? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding about apology if you have to make one. But if you're owed one, there is no misunderstanding about what an apology is, right? If you're a victim, you understand what an apology has to obtain. And, it, and uh, my, my, my most current book, which came out last year, um, is about really, the, the first part of the book is about this victim dimension of crisis. Let me talk about it for a couple minutes, and then uh, I'll open it up to the floor. But you know, the thing that, I define a crisis this way. Um, a crisis is a people-stopping, show-stopping, product-stopping, reputationally defining event that, that it's actually reputationally redefining event that creates victims and or explosive visibility. In my experience, the number of crises that actually get visible are very few because there's just you know, not enough people covering the stuff to cover them all. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the, the real issue and the real important issue in the definition of crisis is that word victims. Um, uh, it, it's something which isn't really talked about. Um, I see crisis plans of all kinds every year, and I've never seen one, well, I've seen a couple because they're in the big the business, but, but I've never seen a plan, a corporate plan or a nonprofit plan, that talked about the victim dimension of crisis. And when you think about this, whatever your level of experience is in this, in this arena, I mean, you suddenly realize, if you haven't made for it, that it isn't what you did that is the problem. It isn't even what you're doing about it that's the problem, that causes the visibility, causes the, the, the anguish, it's the, the fact that we have created victims and they're driving the level of media coverage. So, so I, I've been teaching for many years now a, a, a strategy of crisis response, which I just, I'll talk, it's very brief, but that accommodates this, the, the power that victims have, we can talk about this more if you like, but I, I, I advocate a general response, I call it the grand strategy, and it has, it's five parts, it's very simple. Um, the first ingredient of crisis response is to stop the production of victims. Stop the production of victims. A lot of things we do, a lot of things we talk about, a lot of meetings get held when bad things happen, but the real issue is, it's, you know, the, probably the, the, the best metaphor is that pipe that burst in the Gulf of Mexico. 24-7 you know, we're watching that thing spew junk out of there, creating all kinds of victims. The first ingredient of a crisis response is stopping the production of victims. There are three kinds of victims, okay? People, animals, living systems. Been at this a long time. When I first started, the only kind of victims we paid attention to were people. Then animals came along, and an environment came along with the uh, Valdez spill uh, in 1989. Um, but it's these living systems, living entities, and the, our effect on them that creates this environment and circumstance of victimization. And this is what the media coverage is about. This is what the angst is about. And if we fail to address that, which we often don't, we leave it to other people, we leave it to the firemen, security people, police. Um, they're nice folks, they're very dedicated, they do wonderful work, but they're not the perpetrators. We are, we have a responsibility to step in and manage the victim dimension. This translates into essentially a section in your plan for what the top people should be doing from the moment they get, it gets started. The top people should be one, setting the tone of the response. The tone of the response. There's a pattern of failure. One of the, the, first, the first incident of indication of failure is the denial by the perpetrator that there's anything wrong for as long as possible. This creates even more victimi victims and re-victimizes those who are victims. The 
The second step in the process is what I call managing the victim dimension. That's really what I'm talking about here. The prime responsibility of leaders of organizations who perpetrate problems is to manage the victim dimension. It starts by setting the tone. It starts by, uh, uh, it continues by being actively involved with resolving victim issues. If you think about it, any crisis that you, what we watch covered or reported on or talked about, the conversation is what are they doing about those who are injured or those who are having problems? And failure to address these two issues, both stopping the production and managing the problems victims have, is what the news is basically about, the bad news. But if you choose to be, if you choose to deny, to start with, you know, then you, then, then you are in a problem non-communication. And, and the one thing we know about crisis response is that silence is the most toxic strategy. Just is the most toxic and painful. Third step in this five-step process is to communicate with your key constituents or stakeholders. And the reason is most information on these circumstances doesn't come from the leadership of the organization. It comes from within the organization. First of all, most leaders are inaccessible by choice, which is foolish. But secondly, you know, they're not trusted anyway because you're the people in charge when thing blew, something blew up, burned down, or whatever. So they talk to people. They know who works there. Your employees, your shareholders, perhaps your customers. Say, what are they doing over there? What do you think about this? Think about the target circumstance. You know, target wasn't talking in the beginning, um, but there was plenty of news coverage. Who are they talking to? Customers, all kinds of folks, bankers, that sort of thing. I was interviewed several times during that, the, the height of that problem, and um, Channel Nine wanted to interview me in front of a Target store. I remember the Friday when they had the ten, or the, they had the ten percent discount fiasco. Mm -hmm. Well, t the Channel Nine wanted me to talk about that on camera in front of a Target store. We could not find a place to park. Okay, there were so many customers doing so much heavy duty shopping. We went back to Channel Nine and filled it in one of their studio, so to speak. But that's another whole story. But talking to employees is a crucial key because they're the ones who are going to be talking for you. And if, you know, if they don't know, what are they going to do? They're going to talk. And they're going to make it up. Whatever they make up, you won't. My strategy for internal communication is pretty simple. We operate in essentially statement mode, that is, we don't use press releases, we use statements attributed to somebody in authority. They're rarely more than 100 words long. There are studies that indicate that human beings, this is, I work in many cultures, this is true in many cultures, you know, people can absorb and even repeat with some accuracy about 100 words that they hear or read. So I'd rather do small bursts, frequent small bursts of information over time, and, and the, the, these bursts decline as the, as, the, as the temperature of the circumstance declines. And so people inside have the information they need that is approved, that is authorized. But you know what happens? It's so funny. When you start doing this, employees don't talk anymore. They say, there's a guy, we got a guy in PR, his name is Cameron something, you know. <laughs> Call him, here's his number. Which is what you want, without having to order people not to talk. Because you order people not to talk, they have to talk. You know, it's like when you were a kid and they said, don't put your finger in the outlet, mm -hmm. do it anyway. It's so interesting how people behave. Give them a little information. Nobody I've ever met in a company except for the person whose reputation, job was on the line, really cared that much about what was going on, what the circumstances were. They just wanted to know that somebody up top knew the place was on fire and was doing something about it. That's all they want to know. But typically what you know what happens is, there are these meetings, they call them huddling, the bosses get in the room, close the door, and a couple, three hours later, they're still debating the first hundred words. Keep it simple. Skip all the fancy stuff, make a statement, and make it now. Now the thing about, the thing about bad news is it always gets worse. It always ripens badly. Yeah, please. And isn't it better to, uh, even if you don't have all the information to say, you know, we're looking into it and we're gathering the information? Well, the reason I'm talking about this five-step process is that whenever you face a situation like a crisis where you sometimes never know 
completely what's going on. We just never do. Um, we can talk about the process of response. You're right. We can talk about what we're doing, what, what's going on, in a very sensible way. So we've talked about three things so far. Stopping the production of victims, managing the victims of the situation, talking to employees, which is important. Fourth step is to notify those who need notification. Um, people who have oversight of us or issue permits or um, just deserve to know for some reason. They might be customers, they might be uh, colleagues, they might be you know, flanking businesses that we work with in various circumstances. They need to know, need to talk to them. And the fifth step in this process then is what I call uh, managing the, the uh, self-appointed, self-anointed, okay? The media, the bloviator, the belly acres, all those folks that we now have in our universe these days when something bad happens. And even when something good happens. Now what I just described to you and why this is important is this is this is the strategy, the steps in the strategy you need. This is a management approach. This is a leadership approach. This is what leaders should be doing and how we help them get through these circumstances. It makes sense to them. It's a process. It's not just hip shooting PR stuff. And they know in their heart that this is what they should be doing. They really do. Everybody has a mom. Sometimes I bring mom into it. They're reluctant to do things. but. And you know, so what I've really described to you is what I call, what I, I, I've stolen this, I guess, you, the golden hour. Anybody here heard of the golden hour as a concept? Some of you have? The golden hour comes from military medicine. Uh, the helicopter was invented just at the end of World War II. And still in, in, in military conflicts, the, 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 the single most um, common reason for soldiers dying from injuries and wounds is they bleed to death on the battlefield or on the way to being helped. The helicopter was invented and the US Army um, began applying it to the treatment of soldiers. And in the Korean War, you remember, they, 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 we saw these helicopters flying around, there was the hospitals. These were called um, uh, mobile army surgical hospitals. MASHs, remember this MASH show? Um, what they did was they moved the hospital, instead of putting them way in the back somewhere, they put them on the front line, on the battle line. And in the process, they decreased the treatment time from injury to treatment, serious medical treatment. These, these were hospitals, they were just surgeries. And they had some of those brilliant surgeries, surgeons from the country working in these things. So what happened was they, the helicopters flew them in. They, what they learned was that if you can treat a, a wounded soldier within an hour, 60 minutes of their wounds, their odds of survival literally are on a vertical slope. At the end of the Korean War, the data showed that 97% of those who arrived alive at a MASH left alive from a MASH. I'm describing these five steps I think are your golden hour. In fact, I'll give you 120 minutes, your golden two hours, to get these things started. Because, I mean, it is a very valid observation that we know so little when a crisis happens. I mean, this is why it's a crisis. We don't know what's going on. And we're hearing all this junk from a lot of people who don't know anything more than we do. And we're making it up. But this is a concrete, useful strategy that accommodates everything you're responsible for when these things happen. Get them all going in the first couple of hours. Better things will happen. And you'll, you'll have some time to learn what's going on. So, you know, going back to my initial comment, you know, the, 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 the issue, the, the operative word here is victims. And we know a lot about this. There is a reprint in your document um, called um, uh, Managing a Mass Casualty Situation, with the victim dimension of a mass casualty situation. I define mass casualties as two injured people in the same room together or in the same vicinity. One victim, suitably motivated, can change the direction of your company, your culture, your leadership, public policy, in this country, in, in, fact, in every country. It isn't a mob that changes things. It's two or three or four really committed people who will not take no for an answer. And ironically, in the management mentality, you know, it's like, well, there aren't that many people who are hurt. There's only like a few, two or three who are really raising heck about this. 
Why should we care about those people? And the answer is because they can change your destiny. They just can. And you have to pay attention to people. There's a, there's a reprint, there's a, there's a blog in here called Sitting Down with Critics, Bloviators, Belly Acres, and Complainers. Why? And the answer is very simple. The answer is because. Because you have to. It's expected of you by your employees, by the victims themselves, by the community, by people who have authority over you, by public officials. So when you debate whether we should talk to somebody or not just because they're mad at us and vocal about it, and you don't do it, guess who's going to win? It's not going to be you. Your life is going to be miserable. And we do have management, I mean, management today, and this is just, we've, we've exported this to management around the world, actually, have these very strange notions about how we manage these circumstances. And what they misunderstand is this victim dimension. So I urge you to pursue this. I've got some really good stuff in here, right? Read about it. And the reason that they don't pursue it is because victims act so irrationally. And this is what half the discussions are about that you've been involved in, right? Well, well, you know, we're trying to help them. Why, why don't they appreciate what we're trying to do? The answer is they can't appreciate it because they're victims. And victims have problems. And, you know, stopping because people are acting irrational. When, when, when I'm in a meeting with people, they're saying, but they're, they're being irrational. And I say, yes, you get it. They're irrational. There's a different way we handle these things. And process is one of them. Process approaches is one of them. Very important subject. Anyway, back to our back to the Pope. Um, he's asking for forgiveness. The problem with asking for forgiveness is he and the church have done nothing to earn it. The title of the of the I'll, I'll give you a copy of it. We have it even in public. Is where's the apology? The crux of victim management is apology. Want to have a lively discussion in your organization? Talk about apologize. I define apology as the atomic energy of empathy. It stops things. Apologies stop arguments. Apologies stop fights. Apologies stop litigation. Listen up. But in 1999, 1991, um, the, the uh, VA, the Veterans Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, started an experiment which they called extreme honesty. By the way, you can look, this is a really interesting piece. If you go in your browser and look up the phrase extreme honesty, um, a couple of things will come up. My name will come up because I've written about it. But what you're looking for is uh, an article from the December 1999 issue of uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine. The article is called Extreme Honesty, and it talks about this 10-year experiment that the, the VA hospital did with essentially immediate disclosure and immediate uh, revelation when there's an adverse outcome in a medical situation. And there's quite often an apology as well. They talk about what they did, the impact it had on patients, but more importantly, they, it's an article to begin to quantify the impact of some strategy to reduce litigation, that was the goal. Since that time, uh, there's a movement in American healthcare called the I'm Sorry Movement. Minnesota happens to be a leader in it. And it's about the notion of apologizing and acknowledging adversity in medical healthcare right away. The crux of it is, if something happens that's adverse to the patient, almost no matter what it is, um, the, 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 the medical people in charge uh, immediately determine what happened. They, they meet with the patient or someone caring for the patient and talk about what happened. What was responsible? Or who was responsible? They usually have claims people there. So they can, they can have the patient or the people caring for them file claims easily. If it's serious enough, you know, the smart hospital brings their, brings their attorney along and invites the patient or patients having to bring their attorney in to sit down and talk about lawsuits. What they discovered was that, you know, the more you apologize, the less people sue. They do file more claims, because you're teaching them how to do that. But claims are okay, 
because insurance companies underwrite for this. They they have these, you know, mathematical stuff that figures all these things out. And if you've ever been through a major claim situation, you know, and you're covered, what often happens is your insurance arrangement changes with the with the insurance company because the risks with you have changed. But that's fine. And your rates may go up even. They probably should. But what doesn't happen is litigation. The, the National Law Journal study this now every year. There are a couple of universities studying it in this country and in Canada. They report each year on the impact of apology and this behavior on the resolution of issues where victims are created. Very interesting, very important. Lawyers are, the, law, the, the legal business is beginning to come around and recognize that <clears throat> saying nothing is the toxic strategy. You want trouble? Say nothing to nothing. Jim, you know, yes. on that, the single biggest barrier to good counsel that I've found in practice is the attorney. Um, often because they, they do adopt the, the, the strategy that you're talking about, right. about not exposing to perceive. But the see, I, I get that. But, but, but so the question is, is how do you get through that common barrier um, with this? Because this it's not the lawyer's decision. Yeah. No, the benefit that we have over attorneys is that attorneys have canons of ethics that prohibit certain things that they can do. For example, they really can't recommend a single course of action to a client. They're obligated to provide an, a series of options from which the client chooses. Okay. We, on that score, we're much freer. We can, you know, we can recommend all kinds of crazy stuff, and we often do because we don't know what we're doing. But that's another story. You know, I look at it this way: it's, you know, there's a point in every crisis when you get to a cliff. You have to make a really serious decision. The lawyer has to stop there and say, "You got my best advice, my best counsel at this point in time. Got to make your make your mind up and decide to jump or not. It's up to you." What do we do? Most, most communicators, hey, we're ready to jump. On a moment's notice, right? Just grab my hand, we'll go and see what happens on the way down. Okay. So what I'm telling you is this is not the lawyer's decision. He is a counselor and an advisor just as we are. It's up to the boss, it's up to whoever's in charge making the decisions to decide whether they're going to do it or not do it. And I, I, I push this issue. If I say let's go to the client, the lawyer has to go to the client. He can battle with me if he wants. But that's not what the client's paying him for. He's not paying us to talk. He's paying us to talk to them. So go to the client. Lay it on the table. The client decides. Keep the client where they belong. They make decisions. It's their destiny. It's their future, the doctor about here. It's their money. It's their reputation, not ours, this deal. So um, I take to consider myself the equal of anybody on the team. In my area of communications, you know, the lawyer likes to say, I don't know what crisis management, Jim, but I say, Tell you what, I know that. You know law, I want the law for you. Okay. Uh, chapter nine in my newest book is about law. It's very insightful. There's some flow charts in there to help you understand what's going on in civil and criminal cases. I'm not an attorney, but I have a very uh, ongoing civil and criminal practice. Um, it also talks about lawyers as leakers. Lawyers are the second most frequent leakers in every crisis story. They leak because they can. They leak because Journalists have learned that the weakest part of a lawyer's um, psychology is their desire to talk about their love for the law. So the attorney's approach, the reporter's approach, and some of you are former reporters know this, you just walk up and say, hey, look, this is really complicated. I'm not a lawyer. It's, you know, I've got all this paper and stuff. I need somebody to walk through this. With. You just, now I realize things you can't talk about, and I understand that. I'm not looking for that. You know, but can we can we have a conversation that kind of walks me through a similar circumstance or something where I can just get a handle on you know, what's going on? You know, when you read that article the second day of the crisis when you don't have a clue of what's happening, but all of a sudden there's this huge description of the paper and there's consultants commenting and all the rest. Where does all this come from? Only one. It doesn't come from the mailroom. I guarantee you that. Okay, not come from the mailroom. It's coming from the boardroom or from the legal department or the outside lawyer because they feel they can talk about anything. Every communications plan you have must have a description of the lawyer's latitude for speaking. In my circulation, there's some models in here. It is zero. 
they have a client to serve. They don't serve the media or any other circumstance for any reason unless the client authorizes it. They're prohibited. When the, when the client says to them, you may not speak to anybody, but I'll tell you, they have to abide by it. Their canons demand that they respect what the client has, unless it's illegal, immoral, totally stupid. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've sat in meetings and all of a sudden the neighbor reporter comes up and, the, and one of the lawyers is like, I, I've known Bud for years actually with the same fraternity at the university. Well, they're having a beer every Friday together. What is the lawyer telling this, this reporter? Because the reporter's only having a beer. Why? Because he knows the guys in the company. Well, I, you know, I don't tell them anything. I, I tell them we're good company, we're honorable people. What? You, know. you need to just put a muzzle on them. You can do it. Do it. They actually can't object. They can give you a shot at it, but, and their only, their only argument is that there, 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 there be a, a, an egregious amount of uh, public misunderstanding about what's happening here if you don't allow some of the legal background to talk. What I've learned is, remember what I said earlier? That people don't really care that much about the details. They just want to know you're doing something about it that's honorable, trustworthy, and fits your reputation. They don't care how the law works. They don't care how the law works. Victims don't even care how the law works. They, they really have a right to know. It's just bogus, okay? And it's, it, it has nothing to do with the case. You know, judges hate this stuff. Judges have a courtroom for a reason. They want the stuff done in the courtroom. So keep it there. Um, there's a new trend in public relations these days. It's a big one. Uh, a lot of PR people are going to law school, getting law degrees. You know, a number of the Twin Cities have law degrees after being public relations. Like um, their colleagues don't necessarily consider them lawyers like they are. They consider them lawyers who also are talkers and PR people. Um, I mean, you, you can't do two jobs. You're either a lawyer or you're a PR person. It doesn't matter what all the letters mean off your name. So I've got to keep that in mind when people come and say, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer with a PR background. Quite often this is, they're performing more for their colleagues than they're performing for you. As it turns out. It's just an interesting dimension. But I'm talking the whole time. I don't want to talk the whole time. Um, the bottom line, of, the bottom line of the editorial is, is essentially, you know, um, failure to apologize um, simply revictimizes those who are waiting for one. I work with these victims. I work with victims of these circumstances. I have to tell you, you know, you ask them what, what do you, what do you. What do you look for for an apology? How big an apology can there be to compensate for the suffering you've undergone since you were eight years old, right? I mean, what would it have to, you know, what do you imagine it looks like? And their constant comment to them to me is, no, it doesn't have to be big. I just want somebody to stand up and say, I did this. I'm responsible for your pain and suffering. I did it. That's really all victims are looking for. Despite the lawsuits and the rest of it. Yes. Jim, have you found that the uh, this whole issue changes a lot with increased social media? Has there been any change in terms of this process? Not really. Social media is first of all, most of it's negative. Most of it's critical. Um, most of it's just people who've got the time to do it. You know, eighty percent of what's on the web is produced by twenty percent of the people who are there. I mean, it's just really people have time to do this. I guess maybe because we have high unemployment. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. The thing about the, how our system works, which is so absolutely utterly cool, is you know if it's in court, it's going to be handled by and large properly, because peers make decisions about what happened to their peers. Um, there's there's just a lot of stuff going on in the background. This is what social media has done. Because there's a lot of noise in the background, um, which can have an impact. No question about it. It has to be managed, but. Um, Generally speaking, for companies and organizations and businesses and industries at risk, we really increasingly recommend, in fact, we provide the service here, you know, constant monitoring of these various platforms. Uh, looking for things, looking for language. It's amazing what you can do with these various technologies these days. 
for understanding who's doing what to whom and who's saying what about what. But in terms of getting these things resolved, I, it's interesting. Um, uh, those techniques really have not changed. One of the most frequent questions I get because I look the way I look is, you know, what train, what what changes in crisis management, what changes in uh, behavior have occurred um, in your long career? And, you know, the answer is, um, unless they've invented another commandment, uh, those of us who do crisis work routinely here are watching them break the same 10 day after day after day after day. <laughs> nothing has changed in the perpetration department, okay? There is literally nothing new for the crisis. It's stupid, it's idiotic, you know, and the funny part about it is, when you think about it, we get to work in crisis with really smart people, people who should know better, going in, coming out. Whenever somebody calls me about some issue, I, I ask them, and how did this happen? I, see, their mom has already asked them, what were you thinking? I don't have to ask that question. <laughs> but it's really, you know, how did this come about? And if they say, I don't know, then the response I have is, it's kind of hard to help you, right? Point is, somebody there knows. You know, what's funny is when they call me, generally all the key people are already assembled. They can't figure it out themselves. Sometimes it's happening at 11 30 at night, 4 30 in the afternoon on Friday. And, you know, where's your, where's your management group? Well, they're, they're in my conference room, you know. <laughs> Lock the doors, start serving coffee, don't let them out, you know. In a few hours, somebody will have to get out of there so badly they'll tell you. Because somebody in that room knows. Every time, somebody in that room knows. And they'll tell the media before they tell you. Yes? Jim, you've mentioned Target, and I don't know if you're just tired of talking about it, but it seems to me there are probably some really good lessons to learn from that, good and bad. Actually, I have to say, uh, I, I do many of these. I do um, at least a dozen of these breach cases a year. Um, and uh, it's gotten to the point where breaches aren't really news anymore. Uh, Target was a breach because it was so humongous. It involved consumers and in numbers unheard of before and that sort of thing. Um, they did stumble, fumble, and mumble, but I have to tell you, on the, on the scale of like one to 10 of the average client I have in the circumstance, I mean, they were probably in the eight or nine range for what they should have been doing. Most clients I work with, they never get above four or five. They're only doing four or five because we passed so many laws now that require disclosure. You file reports with the federal government, you have to file special consultants and that sort of stuff to work your way through them. But they do the, the, the smallest amount possible. Target is, I mean, Target behaved, in my judgment, pretty much the way I'd expect a company with its reputation to behave. But the, one of the realities of these situations is when they do blow up as big as this one got, heads are going to roll. You know, when you talk about British Petroleum, we always like to cite, PR people always like to cite the comment that the president at the time made, you know, I want my life back. <laughs> that isn't what he got fired for. Nobody cares about PR in those circumstances. Nobody cares what those people say. That's what the media cared about, because that's what the media does. The media, if it's bad, they want, they want to cover that. When I'm talking about the strategy, I talk about those five steps. You start doing that, and you won't be covered. Why? Because you're boring. We don't cover good people. We cover people screwing things up. But the target thing was so so massive. But then, you know, it's sort of interesting to watch it. Now the other thing occur, the overreaction. You know, here's we're not gonna have like a board shuffle. Yeah. I mean, they're gonna change this company from top to bottom. And I have to ask the question, why are they doing that? But do you think that, that they erred and that they didn't actually come forth right away and say what the problem was? If you that? read the stories and they're Tons of consultants from all over the planet who were quoted in these stories. Um, every consultant, every expert in this field, this field of, of uh, uh, digital, under, digital, digital management and, and security, at the very end of what they talk about is the disclaimer. Well, and you know, um, the people who do this are doing this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so it's almost impossible to keep up with what they're doing. You know, this is a losing game for Target, no matter what. Why? Because you can't keep up with this stuff. Cybersecurity. Can't keep, no, they, they, they're busy. The moment the moment you close this door, they open another one. That's what they do. Okay, what it's about. a lot of consulting on cybersecurity. So we look for, as a society, and this is not just us, you know, the simplest 
easiest solution possible, and we fire people. So, so, so you're, you're gonna, we're firing the top to bottom of this company, and you know, the real question is, what's Target gonna look like in a year or two? Are they gonna be the same company in a year or two? Can they actually maintain the relationship they've had with customers in the past with all of this management shifting and reorganizing right around? It's a big question. Much bigger than the, 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 uh, the breach itself, which they're handling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, they're doing a maximum job on this because they should and they have to. They're responsible. But you know, even on the day that I was interviewed, when at the height of this 10% problem that they, Target had, the only people who were complaining were the people who couldn't get their, their what is it, their Xbox for a discount because the store was prohibited by contract from giving you a discount. We're getting into Target, but no, I, you know, in many, so many ways they were a model company. British Petroleum, you no, know, if you think about it, when this guy was fired, ultimately Tony something or other, right? Here's what he'd gotten done before he was fired. He got the oil shut off. President Obama didn't do that. You know, state governors didn't do that. All the haranguing congressmen in Washington didn't do that. British Petroleum did. He set up a fund, this is the first in history, to prepay, imagine, prepay damages of $30 billion. The fund is still operating, it's controversial because trial lawyers have been trying to chip into that money ever since the accident occurred. And they're working on it, but right now there are even lawsuits about you know, what lawyers are doing, that's, that's not necessarily legal either. They hired thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, literally, to stand on the shore and be ready to pick up the oil when they came ashore. 90% of those people never saw a drop of oil reach the shore, but they were hired nonetheless. They paid people's boat payments, house payments, car payments, salaries for years. They sold a third of the company to raise the money to pay for all of this stuff. This is what the guy they fired did. He basically put in place everything needed to resolve the issue, my five-part strategy kind of thing, you know, before he got fired. But he's gonna be fired anyway. We fire everybody in the job. They're, they're just toast. First question I'm asked usually is, you know, is my job on the line? And, you know, you bet it is. And the odds are you need to find a successor. Way this is going to go down because it always goes down this way. The only thing that satisfies the media shuts them up, satisfies shareholders, and the folks in Washington who get into these things all the time. Jim, can I ask a question? Yes. Going back to your <clears throat> scenario about the poll, and um, you know, he's asking for forgiveness, this type of thing. I truly believe that those folks are also looking for an apology that our legal systems around the world, lawyers are looking to make money in, a, in an attorney's view, money is winning. Why are people so hesitant to give an apology? I, my, my guess is that the Pope was advised not to apologize. We can only really go by what he did. Okay. And, and the point I'm making in the editorial is I not only talk about how you do this, I'm talking about what you specifically have to do to be listened to to get forgiveness. Okay. There's a process here. In fact, it's actually based on the papal encyclical, uh, encyclical from like 1911, interestingly enough. Um, the strategy for gaining forgiveness, which is also in your packet. I'm going to assume that it's also in the article. But um, I believe that. First of all, you know, what the lawyers are doing is what lawyers do. The thing you have to remember is, you know, what is the basic reason that there's a problem here? The basic reason is that people are being sexually assaulted, children, for the most part. And the issue has to focus on the resolution, if it's possible, of the suffering of these individuals. You know, so I don't have to worry about the lawyers making money. I mean, that's just the way our, our system and the system's evolving. And you're right, on a global basis. The real issue is focusing on how do we help these people get beyond the issue. If you're familiar with this issue at all, and we've got, we've got almost 20 people in the room, that means at least two of you probably have suffered from something like this. You never get over it. If it happens when you're nine years old, you never stop being nine. 
Every day you relive this new circumstance. The only similar circumstance that I think is as powerful and painful is being fired, is losing your job voluntar involuntarily. You've not, never been fired, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you have been fired, this is something you live with every day of your life. At some point during that day, you relive the instant in which someone said, we don't have any work for you. It's a catastrophic event in people's lives. There are very few things in life that are as catastrophic as those two. Um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a document in here where I talk about victimization. And I list in there the reason, what causes the victimization. Of the 30 reasons for victimization, bullying is one. But bullying is only 8% physical. It's 92% verbal. Assault is another. But most people recover from assault. Except for just a, a couple kinds of assault. We recover from that. All the other 31 items are things like um, embarrassment, minimizing people's fears and concerns, um, uh, humiliating people. They're all behavioral and verbal. Interesting. It's a communications problem. Interesting. Victimization. And, and part of the reason I want you to think about this is because um, our behavior in these situations, in our behavior, we tend to be logical. And some of the most logical things you might do turn out to be very offensive to victims. You know, giving them answers to their questions constantly in a kindly, helpful way is often looked at being intrusive, being controlling. Um, everything in a victim's life is different from that of a person who is not a victim. And since we're at the crux of victimization in our organization, we need to understand this and teach it to management. This is one of the first things I talk about with clients. Because I want to change their thinking. But ironically, the thinking is often, as you pointed out, you know, we're going to blame the lawyers, we're going to blame all kinds of other actors, but the issue is not about them at all. They're just a part of a play. The, the driving force is with the victims and how we, the perpetrators, behave towards them. Get that right, get that moving, and the rest of the stuff, in, literally no one's going to care about or report about, because it's not what the media is about, it's not what social media is about either. It's all about pretty negative stuff. Push the hot button there. What else? What, what can we talk about that you might find of interest? Question yeah. back to the target example. Uh, you gave them an eight. I thought they did a good job handling, uh, you know, the disclosure of what happened, explaining what happened, um, working with uh, financial financial institutions to communicate what happened to their folks. What I thought, where I thought they failed, was the massive layoff that happened immediately after. What do you think about the timing of that? We all know that it was going to happen at some point. They were, you know, had sort of in a roll, but I think their timing was bad. They just got over this issue. They were kind of looking favorable with the 10% discount. The stores were packed, and the story, the media was starting to tell the positive story about, you know, now it was about, okay, well, people are still loving Target even though they had this breach. And two weeks later, there's, you know, oh, financial issues and then that ten percent was oh just a way to get you know people into the store to um, you know beef up revenue. I I just wonder I feel like that wasn't an eight. I mean it's it's you know, we're, we're, you know, jobs are precious these days. Even here where the unemployment is so low. Um, and I, I don't really I don't really have a sense about that those movements because once they start down that path and you start looking at the hemorrhage of money in an organization, you have to do something to manage it. And all, sadly, the easiest thing to manage is headcount. Uh, pick a number, and then you pick the number of heads, and you chop them off, and by golly, things look better financially pretty quickly. Uh, but that's I, so know, if you want to look at faults in the, the target case, they're the same old, same old faults that every crisis situation has. They waited to talk. Probably the biggest problem they had, they waited to talk. Uh, and you know this is this is like the question about apology. Why don't they apologize sooner? The answer is, we teach managers in this country, especially, not to do this. If you apologize, you're a sissy, and your 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 cohort members will call you from 
your MBA class and rag on you for doing this. You know, gotta stop doing this. You know, this is weak. You, know, you do it, and I gotta do it. You know, knock it out. Uh, and they talk amongst themselves about these things. It's really, it, it's a uh, management in this country has become you know, so dominated by earning a buck as a leader and a manager. And anything gets in the way of it that can't be quantified in some way is not respected. And in fact, it's deterred from being dealt with. And since being a victim is the most highly emotional state you can achieve as a human being, and there's nothing metricizable about it, we don't recognize it. And I mean, questions I often get in larger audiences, sometimes maybe some of you are thinking here, um, I've had people stand up and, and say, look, isn't, isn't an apology, Joan, an act of cowardice? I'm serious. Act of cowardice. I'm just, you know, um, this has happened a few times. It, it happens more frequently in, in uh, businesses involved in, in, like, security work and police-type work and things like that. Where they, this is a key figure, a key concept, because they're first responders. They're the first ones on the scene. They often set the tone by their behavior um, with victims as to what's going on. But the answer to the, the, answer to the question is, I, I look at the apology. I said, the apology I defined as the atomic energy of empathy. Um, and empathy uh, I define as um, actions that speak louder than words. A lot of people define empathy, we brought up to believe that empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes and looking at the world from their perspective. But it mean, if you've been if you've been raped, if you've been sodomized, if you whatever these things are that are bad fired, how can how can you who hasn't been put yourself in their shoes? You cannot do it. But you can you can do things that might help them. You can answer questions, you can do lots of things to help them get through the circumstance. Empathy is about what you do. Actions speak louder than words. My advice always is. The public relations is sort of defined as doing good and taking credit for it. Um, in terms of empathy, um, my definition is doing good and letting the good speak for itself. And you have only one audience anyway. It's the victims for this goodness you're doing. Reporters aren't going to cover it. They rarely do. Most people don't care. Really don't care about victims. They don't have to. We're not a victim. I don't care. That's another whole lecture, but uh, as far as Target's concerned, I think for the most part, they did, under the circumstances, probably the best job they could at this point in time. There are always ways to improve, but but the, the standard, in fact, you actually have a reprinter called mindless criticism, avoiding mindless criticism, and, and catalogs those things that are always said by PR people when asked about how somebody handled a crisis. The reason I got into it, by the way, was because I, on a blog someplace, I would, someone talked to me and I mentioned that the target was doing a good job. The media picked that up because nobody was saying that, right? Who is this guy, anyway, funny last name, who says they're doing a good job? Got lots of interviews. But the fact is, you know, good companies generally behave pretty well in these circumstances. They're still going to get whack because bad news is messy and sloppy and awful and you're going to get whack and it's going to get worse. Get used to it. Speaking yes. Dial it back a little. I mean, we're talking about some very important and extreme case, cases here. A, a week or so, maybe two weeks, um, the Bremer Foundation had a problem where uh, a, um, a watchdog found that they were paying the trustees even six figures and they, they, um, they had fired their executive director. And um, it blew up as some immediate crisis. Mm -hmm. There's not a real victim in, 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 in case this. Um, Why is there not a real victim here? Who would the victim be in this case? The people not getting the money that they paid to the rich guy. That's who the victims are. But, but um, the uh, a trust is a public trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the public is the victim here, and they deserve an apology and compensation, just like just as though they sent somebody to the hospital. There's always a victim in these circumstances. You got to think about who it is, um, and I, you know, th th that, that focus tends to get keep you centered on what's really important to talk about, what's really important to do. Um, but you know, to me, and, and what you talk about is not that. I mean, it's, it's re reasonably common in these circumstances. Um, you know, 
the victim is the public here. Um, and it's, it's those, those people who they might have helped had they not paid six figures to these people who were already richer than God anyway. So it seems to me there is a victim here. Um, a couple of us in the room are involved in education, and so I'm thinking about uh, just broadly some either crises that occur or potential crises. You know, on the student side, it could be threats or violence or stupid things that students do. On the staff side, it could be potential teacher strikes. And often those kinds of issues, um, there's a lot of limits in terms of data privacy, contract negotiation law that limit how much you can say. So. The thing going, you have going for me is nobody really cares about this except the immediate participants. And most of us don't care what the contract says, don't care about what's happening. In a democracy, seven out of ten people don't care because they don't have to care. So it's not a very large audience for the people you can't say things to, okay? And so those people who care, we understand that litigation and, and you're prohibited from you're, you're talking about it. If it's personnel, we understand that. No, we really do. There are four or five reasons like you talked to mention. That, that are very legitimate explanations as to why the information you're providing is limited. Okay, it's limited by law, it's limited by contract, it's limited by, it's limited for these reasons. But the, the general approach is to say, we can't talk about that, or we won't talk about that, which are lies. Anytime you use the word can't, the person receiving that word says you're a liar. What they say in that word, think of yourselves, I mean, somebody says, we can't do this for you, what do you think? You know? Well. Uh, the guy could do it if he wanted to, but for some reason doesn't like me today, he's not going to do it. You know? um, this, is the, this is the whole other area I talk about and teach, uh, about the use of language. And in education, to me, it's so interesting. You know, the average life, the average uh, attendant, uh, what is it, the average term of a superintendent in the United States is like under four years. It's like between three and four years. This is one of the toughest, grindiest, heartless, thoughtless, uh, awful jobs in the world. But but I have a fairly decent practice in education. And, and the issue with educators is that they're smart. And smart people tend to forget who they work for. The community is the ultimate decider of what goes on in the school system. That's the way we set it up, that's the way it happens. And when smart people come along and somehow try to drive things in a way that's too far away from where the community is because they fail to set it up to, for the community to come along, um, because they're smart. Um, now, one of the first things I talk about with school boards, for example, is this vision of victimization. Because if we talk about victims, then we're moving away from race, we're moving away from wealth, we're moving away from all these um, interfering thought processes and idea spoilers, so to speak, and talking about the issue at hand. When somebody's mad, you know, it's not because they're black, it's not because they're brown, it's because you know, something has happened to them that's made them feel victimized. So if we, we separate these other things out of it, then we can go to the heart of the problem, which is this victim has a problem. If they really go after us on this deal, it's going to be painful, serious. Why don't we fix it today? One of the most powerful tools I believe school boards has is public apology. To say you're sorry for things. And to explain, apology is a process. Explain what you're, what you're, what you're being sorry for and what you're going to do to change it. And part of it's listening to the people. That they, I mean, I can tell you that you know, I have, I have um, at the moment, I think it's three or four school boards who are, um, one, another one I'm talking to today, who are in such trouble with their communities because they can't back off from what they think the community should be doing. Why? I got a PhD. They're all PhDs. Well, I'm not a PhD. I fix cars for a living. And I don't like what you're doing in the fourth grade with my daughter. I want it to change. And guess what? I'm going to retire tomorrow, and you're going to become my sole focus for the rest of my life to change the fourth grade. Why? Only because we said no. We didn't listen. We don't change. We're the smart people. This is one of the reasons why American education is in so much trouble today. Smart people who stick to why politics is the same way. We are balkanized. Smart people just can't change their minds or move an inch. But I can tell you, if you follow my directions and your situation, just had one in upstate New York. Um, this one involved actually heroin in the school. They found heroin in a briefcase uh, in, a, in a teacher's locker area. And um, it came to light because it happened a second time 
And the, and the first time the police didn't say anything to anybody about it, they started an investigation. The second time, the police made it public. And the, and the community blew up because they said, the second time? You didn't tell us about the first time? Eight teachers have lockers in that area. The police wanted them to be drug tested. The union says, no way. No way. Seven said, oh, no, it's okay. I, I'll do it. And they did it. One person says they won't. We got a big fight in our hands because the union says, you can't make them do this. Not in the or whatever the reason is. Okay. So that gets people mad at the superintendent, mad at the school, school head of the school board. You know, and what they're debating when I came on the scene was all these angry people. So we had this conversation about an hour on the phone. I finally said, what is the problem here? What are we talking about? I'm asking you, you're there. Well, you know, the union guy need this, and parents need that. What's the problem? The problem is there's heroin in a grade school in your school system. I would think everybody would unite behind getting this out of the schools and keeping it out of the schools. This other stuff is just a distraction. Go to the union people and say, so are you for heroin or against heroin? That's what the question is. You decide. Go to the parents and say, okay, fine, you're upset, but you know, you want heroin in the schools, or shall we all get together and resolve this problem? And by the way, you know, we did screw this up. We just, this was a major mess we created. It's our fault. We apologize. And we're going to show you how apologetically we're going to handle this with all of you. There's no battle anymore. People are signing up to watch the schools, to do stuff in this get the heroin out of the schools drive up there. Are they going to be mad? Yeah, going to be mad next week about something. It's the nature of the beast. But start down this road of recognizing how to de-emotionalize these circumstances. through really being, you know, just good, nice people. I was giving a talk to a school board recently and one of the one of the senior members said after we went through this discussion, she said, you are a much nicer person than I am. She said, I prefer lines, drawing lines, setting limits. I said, each line you draw is a war zone. Each war zone creates casualties and critics. Casualties and critics never die. They never die. And at the worst possible moment, they decide to come and bug you and bleed all over your favorite idea. In, in managing these large public systems, to me, the rule number one is to stop the production of victims, critics, and angry people. They aren't caused by neighbors, they're caused by the actions of leaders. Is that an all responsible kind of advancement? It's like a blow up there. Uh, we're down to the last three minutes. Uh, anybody else got a burning issue? I'm not going anywhere, but I'm happy to see chat afterwards if you'd like to talk. Well, let me ask you this. What, what do you know now that you didn't know uh, an hour or so ago, if anything? I would say uh, just about everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the, what I would say, I, 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 what I would say is that the power of an apology, you know, um, just reinforcing that and um, hearing you say things like, you know, Got the one person who draws lines. In, in the, uh, the example I gave of the, the town of the heroin, mm -hmm. they call a meeting. They were originally going to have meeting, individual meetings with people, and I said, just get them all in a room together. You want the angry. Be sure you get the angry ones there too. Call them up and make them count. Okay. And they started this meeting with an apology. They started the meeting. It wasn't even the school board person there. Somebody who speech for them in this school district. Everybody knows them. They like them. He got up and did this. This really. I wasn't there. It was really um, humble, uh, some, somewhat sad, apologetic explanation of, of how they messed this up. It wasn't an alibi. They weren't forgiving themselves. He talked about how they just sat around and messed this up. No. When the meeting started, this was in a room for 150 holding now 200 people. They had two microphones at every meeting, right? 
They had lines out the door for the microphones. By the time he finished the apology, nobody at the microphones were all sitting down and nobody saying a word. And he said the funny part is the leader, the, the community leader of the opposition of the school board um, was about to get up and talk. And I presume it was his wife put his hand on her, her hand on his arm and said, sit down. This is what happened. This is the power of apology. You said it. No. I've had reaction. You can't do this. You just can't do this. You can't just walk around apologizing to everybody. Apology, apologizing means nothing. Well, the fact is it doesn't have to mean something to anybody. It means something to the victim. That's what this is about. It happens to calm everybody else down. But I don't care about everybody else. I care about the people we've injured. They're the ones who deserve it. You give it to them, and it settles things down. It's pretty cool stuff. Anybody else want to chime in? I mean, what's the most surprising thing to that, if anything? It's 9 o'clock. You get to go. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'll stick around if you want to chat.